Greetings to all our viewers. I'm Nora Hovsepian, Chair of the Armenian National Committee of America Western Region, and I want to welcome you to an important panel discussion that we are proud to co-host today with the Promise Institute for Human Rights at UCLA School of Law. As the largest and most effective grassroots advocacy organization pursuing the Armenian cause, the ANCAWR looks forward to further collaborations with the Institute as we try to tackle the many challenges facing the Armenian people. On the heels of the near unanimous passage in both houses of Congress of resolutions in late 2019, officially recognizing the Armenian genocide, as well as calling for an end to US complicity in Turkey's ongoing denial campaign and encouraging public awareness and education about this important chapter in history, President Joe Biden's official proclamation this year recognizing the Armenian genocide makes US recognition complete and clear. And for this, we are truly grateful. But recognition is just a first step on our long road to justice. And the goal of today's esteemed panel is to explore various paths forward from here. We are so proud to have prominent New York Times journalist, Nicholas Kristof, moderate a stellar lineup of panelists to discuss the Armenian genocide, truth, recognition, and opportunities. And we thank Congressman David Valadeo, Dr. Eric Israelian, Professor Bedros Dermatosian, and human rights attorney, Michelle Galino, for graciously accepting our invitation to provide their personal insights on this important topic. Each has a unique perspective, and we are fortunate to have the opportunity to hear what they have to say. As nearly every Armenian American is a direct descendant of genocide survivors, our quest for justice for this unpunished crime against humanity has been passionately and persistently pursued by generations. And now, with the US recognition behind us, there comes a renewed call for accountability especially given the fact that even today, the genocidal intent displayed by Turkey and its partner Azerbaijan toward the Armenian nation has taken on new life. Within the last eight months, Azerbaijan with Turkish participation killed thousands of Armenians in Artsakh, displaced over 100,000 civilians, captured hundreds of POWs, subjecting many of them to torture, mutilation, and beheading, destroyed ancient Armenian cultural sites, and just in the last week, invaded the sovereign territory of the Republic of Armenia, all with impunity. For this, we call upon the US government to use its influence to stop these war crimes against Armenians, to hold both Turkey and Azerbaijan accountable, to end all US aid, to impose strict sanctions against their leaders and to take an active role in negotiating peace in the region. Without these proactive steps, US recognition of the Armenian genocide while laudable will be rendered a mere symbolic gesture without consequence. We urge you to visit our ANCA social media pages and websites to learn how you can join our March to Justice as we continue forward into the next phase. Thank you again to the Promise Institute, Nicholas Kristof, Congressman David Valadeo, Dr. Eric Israelian, Professor Bedros Dermatosian, Human Rights Attorney Michelle Galino, as well as Susie Abdu and Hagar Shumali for participating in this discussion as we bring you different perspectives and an exchange of ideas on next steps. We look forward to an insightful discussion and we thank you for watching. And now I would like to introduce my co-host, Kate McIntosh, Executive Director of the Promise Institute to provide her welcoming remarks. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you so much, Nora. I'm Kate McIntosh, and we at the Promise Institute for Human Rights are delighted to be hosting this event in collaboration with the Armenian National Committee of America. Promise Institute for Human Rights is a new institute, a young institute at UCLA School of Law, where we focus on training the next generation of human rights lawyers and leaders, 
as well as being an engine of thought leadership in our focus areas. And these are areas which we've chosen because they resonate with our location here in Los Angeles, and also because they are where we see the forefront of the fight for human rights today. They are race and indigeneity, migration, technology, the environment, and very relevantly for today's discussion, accountability. The Armenian genocide is part of our origin story. Our name comes from the film The Promise, which was the first Hollywood depiction of that genocide, and we work to keep that promise. The promise to train students and to build knowledge, awareness and advocacy in support of human rights, both here in America and around the world. I want to say something about the significance of using the word genocide. There is a world of difference between saying that there was a conflict and many people were killed, even saying that hundreds of thousands of people were killed and saying that there's been a genocide. If a genocide occurred, it means that the killing, persecution, forced displacement, and so on, were accompanied by the intent to destroy a human group. And as a global community, we have agreed that this falls into the category of behavior that we call an international crime. A crime which wherever it occurs and against whomever it's perpetrated is actually a crime against all of us. The significance of using the term genocide is the recognition that a terrible wrong, one of the ultimate wrongs, was perpetrated and as a global community we will not accept that. Thank you to everyone for joining us today and I look forward very much to the discussion. And with that I will go ahead and introduce you to our panelists, our esteemed panelists, beginning with a person who really needs no introduction, Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times. Uh, Nick has been a columnist for the New York Times since 2001. He grew up on a farm in Oregon, graduated from Harvard, studied law at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, and then studied Arabic in Cairo. He was a longtime foreign correspondent for the New York Times and speaks various languages. Mr. Kristoff has won two Pulitzer Prizes for his coverage of Tiananmen Square and the genocide in Darfur. Along with many humanitarian awards, such as the Anne Frank Award and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. With his wife, Cheryl Wu Dunn, he has written several books, most recently A Path Appears, about how to make a difference. Their previous book, Half the Sky, was a number one bestseller. Their latest book, Tightrope, Americans Reaching for Hope, was published in, was published, excuse me, in January 2020. Mr. Kristoff, who has lived in four continents and traveled to more than 150 countries, was the New York Times' first blogger and has millions of followers across social media platforms. Welcome, Nick. Thank you. And now, uh, Nick will be moderating today, and the panelists joining him are Congressman David Valadeo, who was born and raised in Hanford, California, in the center of the agriculturally rich 21st Congressional District. Valadeo has taken on leadership roles within the California Milk Advisory Board and Western States Dairy Trade Association. In addition, he was elected as Regional Leadership Council Chairman for Land O'Lakes Incorporated. In 2010, Valadeo was elected to represent California's 30th State Assembly District. He served on several California Assembly Committees, including the Agriculture Committee, where he held the position of Committee Vice Chair. In 2012, the Congressman was elected to represent California's 21st Congressional District. He was re-elected for his second term in November 2014. In 2016, Valadeo was elected to serve a third term and served on the Influential House Appropriations Committee, which is the committee responsible for funding the federal government and determining where American, American tax dollars are spent. Most recently in 2020, the Congressman was elected to return to Washington to serve in the House of Representatives. Since he came to Congress, Valadeo has established himself as a leader in agri agriculture, water policy, two important issues for his constituents in California Congressional District 21. His time in Congress has been focused on combating the water issues impacting California's Central Valley. In the 114th Congress, Valadeo introduced H.R. 2829, the Western Water and American Food Security Act, to address the regulatory burdens that have largely contributed to, the, to serve drought conditions in Central and Southern California. He aims to ensure Congress does everything in their power to provide relief for the farmers, families, and entire communities suffering from the current water crisis. This Congress, Valadeo has introduced H.R. 23, 
the Gaining Responsibility on Water Act to improve Western water reliability in the U.S., Finally, Valadeo's work on the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Committee has fostered his interest in ensuring our active duty military members have the tools and services they need to defend our, na our nation and keep Americans safe. Congressman, welcome. Thank you, appreciate that. Next with us is Dr. Eric Israelian. He is the chief of the Vach and Tamar Manukian Division of Digestive Diseases at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He holds a Master of Public Health as well as an MBA, both from UCLA. Dr. Israelian served on the Medical Board of California from 2010 to 2011 after being appointed by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. He is also an Emmy-nominated producer. Most notably, he produced The Promise by Terry George, starring Oscar Isaac and Christian Bale. He also produced the educational companion doctor documentary, Intent to Destroy, with Joe Berlinger, which was nominated for an Outstanding Historical Documentary Emmy. These films and the accompanying social impact campaigns with organizations such as the, Amer the Armenian National Committee of America drew unprecedented attention to the Armenian genocide, contributed to the U.S. government recognition of the historical facts, and led to the creation of the Promise Institute for Human Rights and the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA. In 2019, Israelian and his partners at Forgotten Man Films launched Som TV, a new streaming service which recently produced Francesco, oh, yes, Francesco, about Pope Francis' efforts to deal with some of the biggest crises facing the world. And the film also highlighted Pope Francis' efforts to recognize the Armenian genocide. Welcome, Dr. Israelian. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And with us, Professor Bedros Dermatosian is the Hyman Rosenberg Associate Professor in Judaic Studies and the Vice Chair of the Department of History at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He is the author and editor of multiple books, including the award-winning Shattered Dreams of Revolution, From Liberty to Violence in the Late Ottoman Empire. He is the author of the forthcoming book, The Adana Massacres of 1909, as well as the editor of Genocide Denial in the 21st Century. He is the series editor of Armenians in the Modern and Early Modern World and the president of the Society for Armenian Studies. Welcome, Dr. Dermatosian. Thank you very much, Susan. And last but not least, with us, attorney M Michelle Galino is the International Legal Associate at the Human Rights Foundation, where her work focuses on closed societies. As part of the foundation's legal and policy team, she supports the Impact Litigation Program and in providing international legal representation to prisoners of conscience before semi-judicial bodies. She also spearheads efforts on the anti-corruption initiative to document links between corruption and authoritarianism and prepare cases under the global Magnitsky, Magnitsky Act. Michelle previously worked on advocacy issues pertaining to international women's human rights across Sub-Saharan Africa and provided direct relief services for trafficking survivors. Michelle holds a JD from Georgetown University Law Center, an MLIT in International Security Studies from the University of St. Andrews, and graduated Phi Beta Kappa with a double BA in political science and romance languages and literatures from Johns Hopkins University. She has served as a guest speaker and been featured in international media outlets on matters ranging from humanitarian crises in Africa to the Kremlin's political prisoners. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you all for being here. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our esteemed moderator, Nick Kristoff. Thank you so much, Susie. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's a terrific panel, and uh, I'm, you know, very eager to to start the conversation. Um, and um, Congressman Valadeo, maybe I'll start with you since you have a, a perch in in Washington. Um, I guess I should say that we're also both West Coast farm boys. You want a dairy farm, me on a, a sheep and cherry farm, but um, we'll try to avoid conversations about uh, <laughs> about farming. Um, I want to. You know, I want to ask you about the significance of the acknowledgement uh, by the U.S. of genocide. On the one hand, it feels like such a triumph. It's something that, you know, it seemed so overdue that we've been pushing for for so long. And I guess my fundamental question is, does this reflect a new awareness in the administration and in Congress of the importance of the genocide and human rights issues? 
Or is it more cynically simply a matter of Prime Minister Erdogan losing influence, of Turkey being on the down and outs in Washington and no longer having the power to resist this kind of determination? I think you're muted. Yeah, I actually think it has more to do with, uh, with the, the administration and many here in the U.S. recognizing that this is important to a lot of folks. Uh, I, in my term in the state legislature, I, I served with a member of the assembly, Kacho Chajian, who uh, had, uh, I'd spend many evenings with him after dinner uh, talking about this, and it was a very personal thing, and, and it was an issue that I started to, uh, to understand more as I met more people of Armenian descent here in the U.S., and this was something that affected them personally because it was their parents or their grandparents and they heard those stories. And I think those stories ended up uh, getting to the uh, folks like myself who continue to put pressure on the administration. And this became a reality because of many of these folks telling these personal stories. And it's something that obviously affects a lot of people across the U.S. And I think it's something that's very important for the U.S. to recognize is um, honesty in, in, uh, in the situation and transparency in the situation so we can move on. Uh, to the next topic. I guess, though, that that's one thing that that strikes me and maybe even troubles me a little bit, that the drive for this has come very much from, you know, because of the, frankly, the political power of the Armenian American community. And it's been led by members of Congress who have large Armenian American constituents, constituencies. And, you know, I wonder to what extent this can be a prelude to addressing broader, you know, to, to getting other congressmen who don't have those Armenian Americans in their districts uh, to get engaged and to get engaged on broader issues that don't, you know, that involve genocide more generally. Is this a, a foot in the door to, to more broadly address these issues? I believe so. Every time we bring it up on the floor for a vote, uh, it forces another member of Congress, like you say, that doesn't have a large constituency to look at this issue and learn about this issue and their staffs to learn about this issue and get to the point where they understand it well enough to feel comfortable voting in favor of those resolutions. So I, I think that's helped us along the way and it's educated more people across the country. And obviously every time that vote happens, it is news. And then obviously with uh, President Biden making the announcement that he did uh, recognizing the genocide, Again, that added to the, the attention and obviously more people know and understand the issue a lot better now than they did in the past. Uh, and this is gonna affect people who even do not have large Armenian populations in their district. Um, Eric, uh, you know, as David mentions, there really has been growing awareness of this uh, issue 20 years ago. I think, um, you know, the many folks would not have considered this a genocide and now broadly in the security community and national community they do and I think you're one of the reasons for that change I think you did a lot to build that that awareness can you talk about how that change in awareness came about across the country what are the lessons learned well uh, first of all I just want to say thank you to you Nick for moderating this panel and I'm honored to be on with all these esteemed guests and uh, people who have really led the charge towards this recognition. And I want to thank everyone for joining. Uh, it's an example of worlds colliding for me because uh, I'm so proud of the work that ANCA has done for decades and excellent work that really has helped lead and set the foundation for securing this genocide recognition in the United States. And the Promise Institute for Human Rights um, is an important uh, feature now of our university at UCLA and I think in the human rights landscape in the legal community. So. Um, really, I, I love seeing these two organizations come together. Um, and again, thank you for the kind words. I think it, it really has taken uh, generations of people working together. I think one of the things that we tried to do as a team was just to try to break through the uh, Armenian community uh, and also engage people who weren't Armenian, weren't descendants of genocide survivors like, like I am. Like my great grandparents were genocide survivors, but we really tried to engage you know, uh, congressional leaders like Congressman Valadeo and others uh, who really were touched. Everyone's had an Armenian story. They have an Armenian friend um, and has heard these stories over the years, but really getting them to be the ones that were calling members of Congress, members of the Senate, getting them to be calling uh, the Biden administration, um, building a coalition of social uh, impact organizations along with these films. I mean, uh, you heard Kate mention the definition of genocide using intent to destroy. And I've shamelessly had these plugs behind me because Intent to Destroy was the historical counterpart we made to The Promise. I mean, The Promise is just a feature film, but what, what my 
and colleagues and friends at ANCA and other uh, organizations have told me is that they were just having a hard time penetrating, you know, the 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 barriers that existed, the geopolitical barriers. And I think uh, in, one of my hopes was always to just try to use my relationships in the community with people who were not Armenian to have them be our advocates. I know in the last few weeks prior to President Biden's uh, statement, uh, countless non-Armenians were calling members of uh, President Biden's team and lobbying hard on our behalf, because I'm sure there were some people within the administration who were saying, well, maybe this is not such a great idea. I know you made a campaign promise, but we have this, we have that. You know, the men in black come out of the, the walls of the Oval Office and say, what about this? What about that? And, you know, it was just time to put that to an end. And I'm really grateful for everyone who uh, has contributed to this over really the decades, particularly historians and scholars and, and human rights advocates who really set the stage and provided the substance. And, you know, we just had to put a little bit of style on it. And, and so while on the one hand celebrating, you know, this recognition, what are the next steps? Well, I think there's, a, I mean, it's a multi-part process. I mean, this was just a milestone, but it was obviously an important milestone. As I talked to some friends who say, well, they just, it's just a word. You know, what do we do next? I say, yeah, but we've been fighting for that word for 70 years. So at some point you have to actually acknowledge the reality that that was an incredibly difficult ceiling to break through. Um, I think ultimately uh, for, for the, not just the descendants of uh, victims or survivors, but uh, uh, for potential victims of future genocides, it's important to have punishment uh, ultimately, and some sort of legal reckoning for uh, governments that conduct genocidal campaigns. Uh, you know, dealing with historical processes is much more complicated, but I think if governments look around and see that there are no consequences for human rights violations, then they are more emboldened to behave with impunity. And I think it's truly important for us to be able to use this as an example of that there is no statute of limitations. Um, that you can never run, you know, the clock out and just hope that people forget. I mean, this has been a, a clearly orchestrated attempt of denial. The denial has actually become a cottage industry. You know, it's a, it's a completely uh, transparent process that the, uh, the, the government of the Republic of Turkey has conducted and its allies over the years. So I think we have to basically now uh, get other countries to also follow the United States lead, which we know will happen. You know, that's one of the things that all of our um, you know, scholars have told us, you know, the, the getting the, the um, Library of Congress to use the word genocide was the first step. Now, almost every library in the world will soon follow suit, although, you know, we don't know about some of the countries that are denialist countries. But, um, you know, I, I think the goal is to basically now march forward, engage other countries to follow the United States uh, example. And hopefully at one, one day, the Republic of Turkey will also recognize the Armenian genocide. Um. That's actually a nice um, segue, uh, Bedros, to a, a question I wanted to ask you. You, you know, you've looked at this issue in, with a with a depth that I really admire and learn from, and um, and I've had conversations in Turkey with people about the genocide. Uh, you know, including once Prime Minister Erdogan trying to argue with me and telling me in Armenian that no, there was no genocide. And, uh, and I, just, uh, I just wonder whether this is a prelude to reality setting in, in Turkey, um, whether there is anything that we can do from the outside that instead of getting, you know, Turks feeling defensive and uh, circling the wagons, there's a way to actually encourage more open historical research and debate. Is there anything we can do to promote that and lead to better outcomes? Well, I think one of the points is to uh, in, to enter into dialogue with the Turkish society, with the Turkish civil society. And there are many scholars within Turkey who accept the fact that it's a genocide, but they're acting and they're, uh, they're, they're, they're talking in an environment of intimidation by the Turkish government, more so today where authoritarian tendencies are in the rise. And uh, more and more people are being imprisoned for their political views, for their political activism. And uh, there was some hope when er Erdogan's AKP regime came into power with this Islamic modernism and 
bit opening of the society where you have the beginning of the discussion of the Armenian genocide as a which was a taboo within Turkey but and but these hopes faded uh, uh, eventually as the, the uh, justice uh, party became more uh, controlling and more authoritarian its tendency towards its society and after the coup that took place a few years ago it's uh, and, and uh, which led to major crack on the freedom of speech freedom of gathering and uh, and other other aspects of democracy i think i'm a bit pessimist uh, about this i think the real change which should come and from the government itself and not the civil society with it with its current policy with its with its current uh, you know uh, uh, cracking down on 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 democracy i don't see a hope from the turkish civil society the only way that Turkey is going to accept the Armenian genocide as the historical fact if there is pressure over Turkey, mounting pressure over Turkey from outside. Of course, this might backfire because Turkey until today has been very adamant and vehemently uh, denies that the genocide has taken place. And we see this happening over and over. Whatever government comes into power, uh, we see this happening. But again, there was some hope in the beginning with Erdogan's regime He's the only person at the beginning who extended his uh, condolences to Armenian, Armenians but for World War I, but never mentioned as to what happened. This was a symbolic gesture, which really went off the, uh, it, which really uh, faded actually. And now today there is much more uh, uh, active denialism by the Turkish government both within Turkey and abroad by, mo uh, by mobilizing all the Turkish embassies, consulates, professors, student mm -hmm. association within different parts of the United States and Europe and other parts too. Uh, and so how, Bedros, so how do we then leverage the United States decision to try to build, build a broader international consensus about the genocide in ways that might put pressure on Erdogan and uh, not only an awareness of what happened 100 years ago, but also in terms of behavior today? Well, I, I think this comes to the issue as to what would be the practical aspect of the, of the genocide recognition. Of course, genocide recognition is important by the United States, a major milestone, but I'm more concerned about the Armenians within Armenia today and within Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh. It, the recognition should be translated into practical steps. I think the White House should take strong measures to help protect the security of Armenians, including that, that of Artsakh. And they should do so by providing humanitarian relief. They should sanction Turkey and Azerbaijan for their involvement in the recent conflict. However, it's very troubling that after one week of Biden's statement, his administration waives section 907, which is a congressional ban on military assistance to Azerbaijan, an authoritarian country, country who is responsible for killing more than 5,000 Armenians. And all, all of you know what section, section 907 is, Freedom Support Act, which indicates United States assistance under this or any other act may not be, may not provide, be provided to the government of Azerbaijan until the president determines and so reports to the Congress that the government of Azerbaijan is taking demonstrable steps to seize all blockades and other offensive uses of force against Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. As we're talking today, Azerbaijan has entered Armenian, Armenian borders per se in the region, in the southern region of Sunik. So I don't know about this situation. How can we translate this situation? And on the one step, recognizing the Armenian genocide, one week later, waving 907. I want to come back to that uh, issue in, uh, in just a moment. But first, Michelle, let me ask you about this question of implications beyond the Armenian community. You've worked a lot in human rights issues around the world. Um, and, you know, I guess it seems to me that the best way to honor the Armenians who, were, who died in that genocide is to try to prevent genocides in the 21st century. And it is not obvious to me that um, that that translation is being made. And you know, if one looks at 
the Rohingya in Myanmar or what's happening in Ethiopia, uh, in Tigray, that it's, you know, it's not clear to me that whether it's the Biden administration or public opinion, that we can really make that, uh, you know, leverage the recognition of, of, a, of a genocide uh, in the 20th century into averting one in the 21st. What, what are your thoughts about that? And how can we do a better job at that? So I think, you know, it's first important to first look at Turkey and go broader. Attacks on, on facts in Turkey have resulted in impunity for perpetrators that's being seen elsewhere. In Turkey, there's actually a provision in its penal code that criminalizes insulting Turkishness. And this has been used to prosecute writers who actually use the term genocide in relation to the Armenian reality. And so when we see actual crimes like genocide go unchallenged, the idea that genocide is a crime becomes less and less um, of an actuality for the perpetrator who's in a sense given license to put a, a non-criminal spin on those acts and to even rationalize them. And this means continued impunity. It means the continued possibility of repetition. So I think that genocide recognition is just one piece of the larger picture toward achieving justice. It really remains to be seen how exactly we'll see this play out in terms of informing global action going forward. But I think when we speak of behavioral shifts, we have to first recognize that atrocities like genocides, these are not spontaneous occurrences. These do not have quick fixes. They are the result of a systematic period of discrimination, unspeakable human rights violations. And when the genocide is over, the, the makings of the genocide, the conditions that were brewing that gave way to the genocide, they typically persist. So behavioral shift here, it's, it's not going to happen overnight, but there is hope for it. Um, you know, we have to see genocide recognition paired with other forms of accountability for perpetrators. Of course, different countries have different dynamics, different regional nuances, different power. Um, you know, you mentioned China. We won't see an immediate shift in the behavior of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, where in fact the U.S. recognition of the ongoing Uyghur genocide by China, it actually already happened before this recognition of the Armenian genocide. Um, it's also been disappointing that we've not yet seen a formal declaration by the U.S. of the Rohingya massacres as a genocide. And there's an open investigation into this right now. There's actually a bill in Congress. It's called the Rohingya Genocide Determination Act. And so we'll hopefully see that declaration coming soon and, and show that here too, we're not going to allow diplomatic relations to stand in the way of doing the right thing. I mean, imagine it took a century to recognize the Armenian genocide. We cannot wait a century more to recognize the Rohingya genocide to ensure that China takes action to end its policy toward the Uyghurs. Um, in the case of Myanmar, the military has, has definitely seen this U.S. recognition of the Armenian genocide, but it's not necessarily yet fearful of it because Myanmar has close ties to China um, and it could potentially be shielded by China. So China also doesn't feel like it's been punished in a significant way. Plus it has a U.N. Security Council veto vote. Um, but targeted sanctions, for instance, these are effective tools that can be coupled with a declaration like this. Um, and the Biden administration did announce sanctions against Chinese officials. Um, we've also seen the import of products made with Xinjiang cotton, a result of forced labor. This has been banned here. Um, again, has this immediately stopped the genocide against the Uyghurs? No, but many more people now, they even just know the word Uyghur. Um, the world has seen that we will not remain silent on this issue. And like I said, a formal recognition of genocide, it has to be paired with other mechanisms. It has to be paired with political will. We need international buy-in. Um, we can't allow China to just step in and purchase ties to countries in Southeast Asia with less power. Um, speaking of Myanmar, formal charges of genocide were actually brought against it in the International Court of Justice. And last year it declared that there was evidence of breaches of the Genocide Convention. But a central shortcoming of international criminal justice is that legal conventions like the Genocide Convention um, and the steps necessary to ensure their implementation, they can really ultimately be, be overtaken by, by political and by strategic realities. So in the case of the ICJ's decision with Myanmar, it adopted these what they called provisional measures. Um, so essentially they instructed the government that to, they had to take necessary steps to prevent further genocidal acts, to preserve evidence of the crimes, to report back, 
And these were legally binding orders, but where are the enforcement mechanisms for these? Um, so naturally the Myanmar government has refused to conform with these measures. But it is important to note that even though these problems exist, we saw declarations from Rohingya leaders, from other human rights organizations saying that the ICJ ruling did actually represent a vindication for the Rohingya people because it shows the world that the, that the international court really takes stock of, of these allegations. It takes them seriously. Um, Ethiopia, you mentioned, I think looking to Ethiopia, there we have the, with the ethnically motivated massacres, unbelievable scale of, of sexual violence occurring in the Tigray region right now. The argument for genocidal intent is certainly there. Some have even so, said. So, so Michelle, so if Joe and Jill Biden are kicking back in the White House and, and watching this, uh, so what do you say to him about what the next step is? Okay, they've acknowledged what happened a century ago. What should he do now? So I think, you know, this doesn't detract from the fact that a clear signal has been sent to these countries, even if it hasn't yet been acted upon. Um, it's not to say that the U.S. or other worldwide democracies should stop recognizing genocides when the evidence is clearly there. But I think that probably the, the best tool that our administration has right now to serve as punishment, to serve as a deterrent for future crimes and to encourage this kind of change in behavior that we'd be looking for, um, for perpetrators of genocide or targeted financial sanctions. Um, and in the US, we see this in the form of sanctions under the Global Magnitsky Act. Um, and what this does is it allows for the president to revoke and to block US visas and property of foreigners who've engaged in acts of corruption in these kinds of egregious human rights abuses, you know, torture and the like. And sanctions under the Magnitsky Act have really been deemed particularly effective as a broader diplomatic strategy and making it harder and making it costlier and riskier for intended targets to do things like travel, raise funds, um, send their children to our universities, as well as in deterring and uh, preventing future abuses. So I think this kind of a designation by the Biden administration, um, and it would come out of the State Department and Treasury, it's a formal recognition that an entity, that an individual is culpable in acts of corruption and serious human rights abuses. Um, and these are not imposed arbitrarily. You know, there's a huge amount of work that goes into them, into the determination of the proper thresholds for each of the country's laws. And I would say that it would behoove our administration to work to establish a global sanctions regime. Right now, you know, we have the US, Canada, uh, the UK, we're seeing a, a in EU sanctions regime, and there's a handful of other countries that will hopefully soon come out with it as well. Um, but what this would do, it establishes more credibility to the policymaking decisions then coming out of the US when it sanctions dictatorial regimes. And there will be fewer barriers to civil society, to victims, um, you know, seeking redress, of course, Sanctions are not the full package deal. This is not the same as transitional justice, um, but it is some form of justice that victims can seek. Um, not to mention the fact that too often there are no domestic remedies for individuals. There's no redress available. The circumstances surrounding access to them is so prohibitive. Um, um, so sanctions just need to be accompanied by strong advocacy campaigns within the government and within our legislative bodies. Well, I hope Jill, Joe and Jill Biden are watching, and I hope he was taking notes. Um, <laughs> um, and, I, and I also hope that the Armenian community, having uh, quite properly asked other Americans to join in support of recognition of the genocide, also stands with Uyghurs and Rohingya and uh, Tigrayans uh, in trying to avert uh, slaughters today. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's incumbent on us. Um, David, I wanna uh, come to you and um, Bedros talked about the concern about uh, behavior by Azerbaijan and Turkey today. Uh, how, how much discussion in Congress or in the administration is there about that? Is there a sense that the administration is giving them a pass um, and that calling out what happened 100 years ago has become, instead of a spur to monitoring what happens today, a substitute for it? 
So Bedros brought up uh, a situation that's going on right now, and obviously there's a lot of concern in Congress. And uh, the Armenian uh, caucus that was formed, and I'm one of the co-chairs of, we've been very active on this. We've actually had multiple different phone calls with folks within the State Department and the administration over the past few weeks. We've been sending letters, and uh, we've been very strong in our conversation with them. And in those conversations, myself, uh, Gus Bilirakis, uh, Adam Schiff, uh, Frank Pallone, Jackie Spear, all leaders in the Armenia caucus who have been very, very vocal on this topic for some time. Uh, but the amount of phone calls we've actually been having, uh, conference calls and uh, uh, with the administration is, I think, more than I've, we've done uh, almost on any other issue in a long time. Uh, so there's obviously a lot of outreach. Uh, there was a lot of talk of actually changing the language, I think, and I, I'm guessing Bedros or, or Michelle might have a little more insight, but I don't think 907 allows for the waiver uh, to, to be granted in the situation. Obviously, there was, uh, they're into Armenia right now about three and a half meters, so about two miles for us here in the U.S. that don't uh, translate that over as well. But that's a huge issue. Uh, it's a threat. It's obviously against what 907 is. And so we've been very vocal on that. And so in our last conversation, we were clear with the administration that uh, we were looking into legislation to even strengthen it more than it already is to prevent that um, any waiver for a situation like this. It's obviously a very concerning issue that we see going on as we speak right now. And so, but Ross, let me come to you on that uh, issue in terms of what is going on right now. You know, how can we leverage the <laughs> belated recognition of a genocide into better policy making today toward to the region? Yeah, you're on mute. I mean, mind you that Chris, uh, uh, Chris uh, Nicholas, that the war took place during the during November when Trump was the president, and that was calculated by Azerbaijan and Turkey that no one is going to care about it, and I don't think that the war would have taken place when 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 Biden came to power. If Biden was in power, war wouldn't have taken place. Specifically, after the uh, recognition of the Armenian genocide by uh, by the administration. So now it becomes more difficult, I think, for Azerbaijan to really wage another war. Uh, I might be a bit naive, but I think uh, this, uh, this is the case here. And of course, uh, Russia's influence is also plays an important role. Without Russia, uh, the war wouldn't have taken place again in November because nothing happens in Russia's uh, neighborhood without Russia's green light. Uh, I think, there needs to be uh, uh, there needs to be a lot of effort to put into practice the idea that Armenians will always be vulnerable in that region to mass violence, and we saw that happening in front of the international community and uh, with the silence of the international community, because many countries like the United Kingdom. Other countries have interest in Azerbaijan, British Petroleum, and other, other interests that they have to benefit, and they chose to stay silent. And uh, this war could have been avoided with diplomatic channels. And uh, so I, my, I, my, my suggestion would be that the United States and the Congress and the Biden administrations should be involved more into putting, putting pressure both on Turkey and Azerbaijan to halt their aggressive policy towards Armenia and the vulnerable population of Artsakh. I say Turkey first because, because without Turkey, Azerbaijan wouldn't have waged the war. Turkey played an important role through its generals and its intelligence by directing the war and this is a fact that has been, uh, you know, uh, has been proved by many journalists and international uh, 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 observers. Um, we've just got about uh, 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 four more minutes for the conversation. I want to get to both Eric and Michelle. Um, uh, Eric, what can, is there more we can do in terms of, in terms of education? Um, to build awareness you know, in this country, in other countries, in ways that create not only knowledge of what happened in Armenia, um, but 
also some understanding of, uh, you know, of just the nature of genocide and the forces that can perhaps uh, avert it or mitigate it or over time create accountability for it. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think what, that's truly one of the uh, reasons why we created, for example, the Promise Institute for Human Rights. Um, we have partnered with numerous organizations such as the Shoah Foundation um, and other human rights and memory and testimony organizations. Uh, Discovery Channel has now started teaching uh, about the Armenian genocide and other genocides such as the Holocaust uh, through the Shoah Foundation and using basically testimony, using uh, storytelling such as the material such as The Promise and other types of films. So I, I think it's just the beginning, uh, to be honest with you, and I think uh, it's bad news for, I think, people who want to conduct, uh, you know, human rights violations in the world. I mean, this is, we have to utilize all of the kind of arsenal we have uh, for good using, uh, you know, kind of storytelling in the visual medium to accompany scholarship by historians such as Bedros and others, and then using that information, getting it into the hands of our legislators so that they can, you know, they're bombarded with all sorts of uh, competing information, you know, and, it, and like I said, it's a cottage industry now to try to use disinformation to try to confuse people, to try to, you know, kind of capitalize on the apathy of the average person who's dealing with so many things in the world. And um, I think we have to penetrate that. So I think by creating uh, organizations and institutes like the Promise Institute, partnering with organizations such as ANCA, and then using uh, our legislative leaders to basically try to carry that across the goal line, um, you know, we'll be able to succeed, but it's a long game. I mean, it's taken us so long just to get to this point. Um, unfortunately, I think, you know, if, if you look, I always say, you know, consider the source. So we have a denialist kind of uh, narrative led by, you know, governments that have the worst human rights record in, in the world. So whenever people say, well, why don't we open up, you know, our archives and then try to go and, and look at that. The crime scene has been wiped down for 104 years. That's like a murderer having 104 years to have an opportunity to wipe down the crime scene and say, well, what, you know, come and examine the evidence. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's known. And actually, I, I love your story about President Erdogan because I know many, many people who he's told privately that he knows that there's been genocide. So it's just, it's just one of those situations where it's kind of like a, a few good men you know, it's, it's not the kind of things we talk about at parties, but, you know, there are reasons why geopolitical decisions are made and we have to kind of, use, you know, build some leverage and then use that leverage. So I think we're just getting started. Um, Michelle, let me come to you and, and um, maybe give you the last word on this issue of how we confront denialism, not only vis-a-vis Armenia, but around the world. One of the big challenges we face right now in American politics is that we can't agree on facts. And, uh, you know, that's <laughs> things that are very well documented. Um, in writing about human rights abuses, whether it was in the Ottoman Empire or whether it's in, you know, in, in Xinjiang in China or Myanmar, then there is this battle that takes place on Twitter today that is not very enlightened, that often involves fake videos, fake facts, and, uh, and doesn't really clarify. And, um, you know, everybody seizing on their, on, on, you know, their, their, their talking points. How do we, how do we make progress in this kind of war of these ideological wars over genocides that are, or, or mass atrocities that are happening today in ways that will actually lead to greater uh, public uh, interest in, in, in resolving them and greater accountability in the end. Well, something that I hear consistently from working with human rights activists is that solidarity for them goes a long way in refueling them. Um, what a formal recognition by more countries would do is say that this trauma was undeserved and it cannot be justified and it cannot be denied. And denialism, what it does is it really doubles down on the pain. It perpetuals, it perpetuates the cycle of, of trauma and every stage of grief that comes with it. And for the Armenian diaspora, this is really an intergenerational trauma. 
And too often there's an effort to dehumanize the victims or to even villainize them. So we need to show that we're unafraid of offending perpetrators. Um, and, you know, and part of this is in continuing to place pressure on our political leadership, campaigning for, as I mentioned, global targeted sanctions regimes, uh, reaching out to representatives like Congressman Valadeo here, you know, calling on them to call what is happening in Ethiopia's Tigray region a genocide. When you call it what it is, it opens up a lot of more pathways, more opportunities for discourse and engagement with politicians. And it also delegitimizes the perpetrators and it delegitimizes their denial of these crimes. You know, genocide is a choice and atrocity crimes, these are not random events. These are not isolated events. And there are indicators that we have of them. Perpetrators, they need time to act, actually carry out the type of violence that they're seeking to carry out. Uh, for instance, with Ethiopia, we saw it took a few years to actually mobilize resources and plot destruction in the Tigray region and, and institute all sorts of propaganda mechanisms that are still ongoing today. Um, but the Ethiopian diaspora in response, what it did was it mobilized, it organized itself in a matter of weeks. And I'd also note the fact that, you know, the U.S. with its final formal recognition of the Armenian genocide, it shows that activism works that the Armenian community mobilized in an incredibly important way. And we're now seeing the fruits of that mobilization and we're paying tribute to it. Um, you know, there's the famous quote that is attributed to Hitler in which he says, who remembers the Armenians? And it, it was kind of a show of confidence in him that he too could get away with the total annihilation of a people because the world would simply look the other way, the world would forget. Um, thank goodness he was ultimately wrong about that, but look how long it did take for the Armenian genocide to be recognized as such. Um, so I think that we have to have a certain level of education for ourselves on the precursors to genocide. The very stage, the very idea that there are stages to genocide implies that we can take measures to prevent its full scales. Um, and I think something else that we have to do as a society that can kind of help to tackle this denialism is um, when looking for redress, when looking for justice and what that might mean here, it might mean that reparations are paid, you know, just like they were in Germany. Um, and reparation means it goes beyond financial payments. It includes erecting memorials, landmarks, committing to dispelling lies and outlawing the use of symbols that can incite hatred. Um, in Germany, we saw the returning of artwork. So um, there are actually about 16 countries across Europe, and I believe as well in Australia, that they've actually made genocide denial illegal. Of course, this raises a host of free speech issues, you know, in other places, but it just goes to show you the difference between that and in Turkey, where writers are jailed for insulting Turkishness by calling the Armenian genocide exactly what it is. Um, so I think in taking these kinds of steps, um, coupled with the recognition of genocide, it will at least bring some sort of measure of you know, we're calling out the perpetrators, this will bring, bring a level of reputational harm and show the world that these perpetrators who typically grandstand on the global stage are human rights abusers. And I think we saw this harm just in Turkey's response to the recognition um, by the US of the gen genocide. So the recognition of a genocide, regardless of the denialists, regardless of the, the legal implications or lack thereof, it shows that we don't need to be compelled to act by an interna international court or any other judicial body, but that we can do so because it's historically accurate and it is the right thing to do. Thank you. Uh, you know, we could go on for much longer. We covered some terrific ground. This was an extraordinary panel. Um, the, you know, the reason that there is an answer to that question of Hitler is in part because of some extraordinary work by people on this panel uh, that has uh, commemorated and honored uh, the Armenian genocide. If just to wrap up a little bit and summarize a bit, I think that there is a general sense that uh, the American acknowledgement of that genocide was really an important step. And, uh, and, and uh, yet it's also a first step and that there has to be more done both in internationalizing uh, that recognition uh, in uh, addressing ongoing issues involving Azerbaijan, uh, Turkey and Armenia uh, and in trend in leveraging that concern for genocide to uh, what is happening today with Uyghurs, with Rohingya, with Tigrayans, and and so on, uh, and that uh, as Armenians we have an obligation to 
to try to pay it forward and to try to uh, address those. And just one, you know, one other thing, I'm, I'm sure that there are some Turkish diplomats and Turkish folks from civil society who are watching. And I just want to say something to you that there's a lot of talk about, you know, what, what happened uh, during the genocide. And there's sometimes a tendency in these kind of conversations to feel defensive. And I hope that you won't feel that. And uh, this isn't, our conversations aren't based on any animus toward Turkey. Uh, it's based on a hope that Turkey can open up civil society, open up these conversations, research this history, confront its history. And, you know, we in the United States have plenty of uh, historical issues that uh, are deeply painful to us. And one of the lessons for us, I think, has been that it is much better for everybody to confront these and openly discuss them, uh, even if it is also painful. And so we would like that to happen in Turkey as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, and that's meant without animus. Um, and now I'm, uh, I'm uh, delighted to uh, introduce Hagar Shamali, uh, a former spokeswoman for the, uh, the uh, U.S. mission to the United Nations, uh, formerly on the, US, on the National Security Council in Washington. Um, Hagar, over to you. Thank you so much, Nick. Just want to make sure you hear me all. Yes, thank you so much, Nick. And thank you for leading such a fantastic conversation that was so fascinating. And we really covered the gamut. Today's conversation was also so wonderful, not only because we're hearing from such a wide range of thought leaders and, uh, and thinkers on this issue um, and history related to the Armenian genocide, but also because of how this discussion was put into the broader context. And so Nick, I really wanna thank you for that. Uh, Representative Valadeo painted a great picture, for example, of how things look inside the beltway. Um, and may I add, uh, Congressman, the way you describe things sound actually refreshingly bipartisan, um, more than the cable news uh, networks depict. So I hope that that's the case for more issues than just this one. Um, Bed Ross, you really gave us an amazing academic and historic look at these issues from your lens, uh, though I do hope that things will change in Turkey one day. Uh, certainly that's, that's what I see from my conversations with Turkish friends. Uh, and uh, and I think Nick's comment just now, you know, reaching out and, and explaining to a Turkish audience that uh, that it doesn't have to be uh, with animus. I think that that makes you know that that might you know maybe that there's a a small step there. Uh, Michelle, you talked about genocides in China, Myanmar, and Ethiopia, and changing the general reality, um, and hopefully moving toward an era where we just identify and state the truth. Um, and I know I hope that when I was in government. Uh, and I left in 2016 after being there for 12 years, there were things that just weren't said or done. It was a very, it was just how foreign policy worked. And I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. That that applies to a wide range of issues. Um, and from what I can tell sitting from my perch, that seems to be changing. It's not 100%, but there are a lot of previous taboos that have already been broken by this administration. So I'm very curious to see how that moves forward, regardless of party, right? It just how we approach foreign policy from now on, including human rights, identifying and stating the truth, um, which kind of leads me to Eric's point, which, you know, Eric, you talked about how this declaration will hopefully prevent other governments that commit atrocities from pursuing their behavior, since, you know, right now they feel that they may might be able to behave with impunity. Um, and it reminds me of something that I learned, a really valuable lesson I learned working for Ambassador Samantha Power when she was the ambassador at the U.S. mission, the United Nations. And one of the things she always told me, and in general, was that eventually everybody faces their day in court. And so even if it might feel frustrating in the moment, or it might feel that something is happened a long time ago, collecting evidence, uh, being act, you know an activist, fighting for the truth and fighting for what's right, really can pay off in the end. Um, and I've seen it you know, in a number of cases. Uh, Nick has certainly written about a number of those cases. Um, Eric also said something that I loved, which is that everyone has an Armenian story or an Armenian friend. And, uh, and so and it reminds me of my story and one of the reasons why it's been so rewarding working on the uh, call uh, to get President Biden to make the declaration, um, which is that uh, my, I'm, I'm born here. Both my parents are from Beirut. Like any good Lebanese, I'm a mutt of a different, uh, many different backgrounds. 
my two great grandfathers on both sides were Armenian, one of whom escaped the massacre of Derbakir. Um, and so this issue has always been personal for me as well, as it is for everyone listening, I'm sure. But Nick, I'm saving my last and most special thanks to you. Thank you so much for moderating this panel and for leading such an interesting conversation. Um, and uh, and I, you know, I'm gonna be selfish for a second. Uh, and as an avid reader of your work, I just wanna thank you for the work you do for your writing and for what you expose. I'm a firm believer that when you cover issues that people may not be aware about, um, aware of, or, or the things that you have tend to write on, you really can affect change for the better. Uh, and that's ultimately, you know, what we're all here for. To all of you in TV land, thank you for joining us on a Sunday night. Um, I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as we did. And please have a good night.